I welcome you to our first communion meeting. I'm saying first communion in quotes because um, as part of our, um, our Archdiocesan requirements, all children or all people, whether they're children or adults, who are going to receive communion for the first time need to be prepared for reconciliation. So we're going to talk tonight about how to get prepared for reconciliation so that then your child can receive First Holy Communion in the spring. Um, and I might say this again later, but I just want to say that the requirement is that your child is prepared for reconciliation. Then it's a matter of discernment whether or not they're ready for reconciliation. So, you know, for preparation and readiness are two different things. So we'll talk about both today. But first, I'd like to begin with prayer. Um, hopefully you picked up a green sheet like this that says reflection on the top. And we'll spend just a few minutes with this. Um, we'll start by saying the opening reflection together. Then there are three four types of social sin that are that's talked about look through it and choose one that really speaks to you think about it for maybe three four or five minutes and then talk to your neighbor about it all right and then we'll close with our closing prayer all right so let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And together let us pray. Do not be afraid. There is no evil to be faced that Christ does not face with us. There is no enemy that Christ has not already conquered. There is no cross to bear that Christ has not already borne for us and does not now bear with us. And on the far side of every cross, we find the newness of life in the Holy Spirit that new life which will reach its fulfillment in the resurrection. This is our faith. This is our witness before the world. Our sin is a failure to weep. Our sin is a failure to act. Our sin is a failure to seek justice. Our sin is a failure to seek peace and reconciliation. And I invite you to choose one, read over the reflection, and then speak to your neighbor about that particular type of sin. So is there anyone who would like to um, share their reflection? Yes. I'll break the mold. Um, the one with our sin is a failure to seek justice. My daughters are in two separate Girl Scout troops, and they are both in their separate troops making bags for the homeless so that we can carry them in our car and give them out as we see fit. And they're things like granola bars, water bottles, so toothbrushes, things like that. That's a really great way of you know, providing outreach. Anything else that came up in your discussion with each other that you'd like to share? Our children especially um, are very aware of the world around them more so than we sometimes think. And so, you know, projects like that help them. Um, it helped them sort of to make sense of the world and how sin is in the world and how we are called to help negate the effects of sin in a way. Let us finish with our closing prayer. It's on the back of the page. And together we pray. We are justified or set right with God, not by failing to sin, but by honestly acknowledging sinfulness. 
God sees us as lovable and good, but also prone to error. We still strive to success ourselves honestly. May we be thankful. May we be contrite. Amen. So today we are talking about sacraments, specifically reconciliation and, and communion, but mostly reconciliation. So first we need to, to talk about what is a sacrament. So can anyone tell me what a sacrament is? Anybody remember that old definition that you might have learned? long ago, or maybe all of you are so much younger than me now that, that you don't remember the Baltimore Catechism definition. No, really? I'll, I'll, I'll help you out about that. It's a sign of God's grace. Really? There's not one person who remembers it? Oh my gosh, I am really good. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> Yes. Instituted by Christ. Yes, instituted by Christ. And what else? Entrusted to the church. So that's that's a little bit rephrased from the old Baltimore Catechism. But basically, a um, sacrament, all sacraments, and how many do we have? Seven. Oh, yes. Seven, <laughs> seven sacraments. Um, all sacraments are a sign of God's grace instituted by Christ, so we see somehow Christ instituting, making them holy, and that the church sort of oversees them. Um, anybody have an idea of what the signs might be for reconciliation? If they're a sign of God's grace, a sign of God's love, what would be the signs? Penance, penance is part of it, yes. The, the penance is the sign of your um, repentance, that you're sorry, that you're, that, that, and then that you're for being forgiven. What else? So you've got the penance. There, are, there were two things, two other things that I could think of. You might think of something else. Don't be shy. How about the the priest? The priest is a sign of God. This, the priest stands, sits in the, in the um, in actual, when you're going to confession, he's usually sitting down. But he is there as the, um, the representation of God and the representation of the community. So he is a sign representing God and the community. So in some way, when then, the third sign is absolution, when the priest absolves you, that's coming from not only God, but it's coming from the community as well. Um, does, can anybody figure out what those seven pictures stand for? <coughs> yes, but which one is which? Oh. First one yeah. is baptism, then probably, although it could also be um, confirmation. It's more likely to be confirmation. I was thinking about this because there are two that could be confirmation or um, or holy orders. You know, they both have this either the stole or the oil. So, and I gave you a, but but yeah. How about the the one with the chalice and the oh, that's Eucharist. That's that's a good one. I'm glad you know that one. How about the um, yeah, I, think, I think that one might be confirmation too. I'm not sure. I didn't make up this thing. So. Uh, what about the two, two rings? That's obvious. Marriage. How about the cross? Holy orders, possibly. How about the, the anointing of the sick? So, what did we miss? Do we miss any reconciliation? So, you know what? I bet that the the stole is probably reconciliation. Now that we think about it, and it's interesting. It's out of. It's a little bit out of order because there are three types of sacraments. One is a sacrament of initiation. And the sacraments of initiation are, does anyone remember? Baptism, Baptism. Mm -hmm. confirmation, Communion. and Eucharist. Oh. And technically speaking, it should, it's supposed to be in that order. Baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. Here in the United States, and I don't know about in the rest of the world, but for the most part we have separated confirmation and baptism, which used to be together, and 
made it, because we have infant baptism, an infant can't say yes, him or herself, right? We're saying yes for them. So we've separated out that confirmation so that that child then has the op opportunity to say, yes, I do believe. But somewhere in between there, kids can understand what Eucharist is about and what it is. So that's why we have Eucharist before confirmation here, at least for now. Um, I'm not, and don't go around saying that I'm ch saying that it's going to change because I'm not saying that. Um, there are also sacraments of healing. So what would they be? Anointing of the sick and reconciliation. Good. Yeah. So we have anointing of the sick and reconciliation. So those are sacraments of healing. They heal not only us physically, but our spiritual healing as, as well. Then the final is the sacraments of vocation, which would be marriage and holy orders. Now, marriage and holy orders aren't the only vocations that are possible. Um, they're just the only vocations that have been elevated to a sacrament. So a vocation is what God is calling you to do. So some people, God is calling you to be a teacher. Some people, God might be calling you to be a firefighter. God might call you to be an electrician. There are all kinds of things God could call you to do. And you know if you're happy doing it, it's probably what God is calling you to. So if you're not happy doing it, go find whatever it is God's calling you to. So that's my advice for today. But today we're going to specifically talk about reconciliation. So the effects. There are actual, actual effects of all the sacraments. And those are real simple. We offer worship to God. Every time we celebrate a sac sacrament, we are worshiping God. They express our faith. They strengthen our faith. They um, establish our ecclesiastical community. And that is just a big word that describes the whole church. Um, and they also effect, they, in a re very real way, the sanctification of humanity, meaning that it helps us to be holy and helps us to one day, if we you know, are, are hopeful, that we will one day be with God in heaven. Um, that all comes from the Code of Canon Law number eight, uh, 840, if you want to look it up. There's a book in the parish office. I can show you one day if you're really interested. But you probably aren't. I am. I think that's really fascinating, having all, but um, <clears throat> most people don't. So, for reconciliation, an important thing, of course, that we talk about is sin. So, what would you say sin is? Don't be, sh come on, people, don't be shy. <laughs> What would you say sin is? How about someone who hasn't answered yet? Okay. A bad choice? Yes, absolutely. A bad choice. When you're talking about children, your children about sin, these are the kinds of things that you're going to talk about. That it's, it's a poor choice. You know, it's um, separating you from God. It's all these things up here, you know, that you've, you know, stealing something, disobeying. All of those different things that kids can understand. But sin's a whole lot more, right? And children, how many people here would say that children can sin? Raise your hand, please. Can children sin? Have your children, is there anyone whose children have never sinned? <laughs> is there anybody, there might be someone in here who's a saint. I won't embarrass you. <laughs> but you know what? Even saints have, are sinners. Right? St. Augustine is like the biggest sinner in the world. And if he can become a saint, there's hope for me too. But do children sin like us? No. They don't sin like us. They sin by not sharing their cookie, by taking their, their, their brother's toy, by, you know, hitting their sister over the head. You know, now those are big things to a child, but to us, those are kind of little sins, right? But to a child, that is a big sin. There goes my paper. Sin has something called a social dimension and a personal dimension. And that is what that handout was kind of about. Was we think a lot about the personal dimension of sin, how what I do affects me, 
what I do affects Grace, what I do affects my brother or my husband or my children. But what I do also affects the people who live in Africa, the people who live in Asia, especially, and I hate to say it, when I go to Walmart and buy something that's been made in a sweatshop. Okay? I mean, that affects those people. I'm not saying don't go to Walmart. Please don't call Father Steve and say that I said not to go to Walmart. But what I'm saying is we have to be conscious of the kind of decisions that we make. Um, so what makes a sin a sin? These are the things. A sin is an offense against our relationship with God. It damages our relationships with other people. And it damages our relationship with the church. The most important point, though, is that we have to do it in full knowledge and freedom to do it. So you have to be able to choose to do it and know it's wrong and then do it anyway. That is what a sin is, okay? So if you've been raised in an environment where you don't know something is wrong, then, well, maybe it's a sin, but will God hold it against you? You know, there's a question about that. If you don't have the freedom to do what's right, and there are, there are many ways if someone's holding a gun to your head, for instance. You know, um, I, I can just think about the, the, time, the times you hear that somebody would do something because someone is blackmailing them. Someone is, is making them, they're holding someone, you know, there are they're, they're reasons that they're doing it that they don't have full control over the situation. That mitigates your responsibility for sin. So there are, there are things that we, um, we can do, things that we know about that make sin a sin, and things that make what looks like a sin maybe not. So when, you know, Pope Francis, that famous phrase, you know, about judging, that he's not going to judge, that's because we can't know what's in someone's heart, and we can't know what, where they've come from, that's causing them to behave the way they've behaved. So we always have to um, act on the side of mercy. Is that hard? Yes. Do I get mad at my daughter anyway? Yes. But I should try to be merciful to her because she's just a, a little child, well, a big child, a 12-year-old <laughs> girl who can pick me up. But still, you know, she's still a child, and I need to be merciful to her, and she needs to be merciful to me too when I make mistakes. Um, sin ruptures our relationship, like true sin, it ruptures our relationship with God and each other. And that is why it's so important for us to partake in the sacrament of reconciliation, because that helps us to c come back into right relationship with God and each other. Next. So, moving right along, we're going to talk about sacra the sacrament of reconciliation. We're going to watch a short video. Why do I have to confess my sins to a priest? If I pray to God, won't he forgive me? If it's been a long time since your last confession, or maybe even just been a while since you've thought about this sacrament, you might be asking yourself this very question. Why? Why is it necessary for me to go into a confessional and confess my sins to a priest in order to be forgiven? Can I just pray to God for forgiveness? Well, yes. You can and should pray to God for forgiveness anytime you're aware of a sin you've committed. But that's only part of the answer because asking God for forgiveness is only part of the remedy for our sins. In order to fully understand why Catholics celebrate the sacrament of penance the way we do, let's look at one of our core beliefs about who we are as a people of faith. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. God has put the body together so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. We are one body, each of us a different yet important part of the whole. The children of God are somehow inextricably connected, 
even though we don't know each other or even like each other. This theology of St. Paul is what Christians refer to as the mystical body of Christ. Each of us may think it's just all about me, or even all about me and God, but that's not how the church sees it. We are all in this together. In fact, St. Paul goes even further in describing the mystical body of Christ. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts share its joy. And when one person sins, it hurts and affects the entire community of believers. Why? Because we are one body in Christ. Oftentimes, a modern approach to sin might be summed up, no harm, no foul. We are under the mistaken impression that if we do something wrong, but no one is aware of it or seemingly harmed by it, it's not really that bad of a sin. For instance, let's say I'm driving in my car when another driver cuts me off or is driving slower than I think they should be. So I let some words slip out that are unkind and mean-spirited. But hey, the other driver didn't hear me, so it's not that bad, right? Wrong. For Catholics, that's still a sin because I am called, along with all of my brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, to be loving and charitable and patient. So when I make a choice that's contrary to how we as believers should live, my sin hurts us all. And I need to ask forgiveness not only from God, but from the other members of the body of Christ as well. Each and every sin we commit harms our relationship with God and harms our relationship to the other members of the community. So it's not enough to simply ask God for forgiveness. Sin creates a separation. The sacrament of penance, also known as the sacrament of reconciliation, is about mending that separation or reconciling us to both God and community. That's why we confess our sins to a priest. He is there as both an intermediary of God's grace and as a representative of the people of God. In fact, in the earliest centuries of the church, Christians would publicly confess their sins to the entire community of believers. Today's practice may be less embarrassing, but it still has the same effect. The priest welcomes us back into the communion of God's people. Although communion is a word we usually associate with a different sacrament, it makes sense here too. Sometimes our sins are so serious, we actually take ourselves out of communion with God and with one another. Excommunication is a scary word that most people think means being kicked out of the church. But in reality, when we commit grave or what we call mortal sins, we remove ourselves from communion with God and the church. That's why the church teaches that if you've committed any mortal sins, you need to go to confession before receiving the Eucharist, because you have to be in communion to receive communion. And that's what's so great about this sacrament of penance, or reconciliation, or confession. No matter how bad our sins are or how long it's been, through God's grace and forgiveness, we are brought back into communion to once again be a part of the body of Christ. And there's even one that tells you exactly how to go to confession. So that one comes up like if you, when you go to their website, um, Busted Halo, and you, you can search for Sacraments 101. That's, this one is Reconciliation 101, and Reconciliation 102 is how to go to confession. So these are the, the basic things about reconciliation that um, we believe. So, reconciliation is a sacrament of conversion. We think a lot about, you know, the sacraments of initiation being convert, like we're converted, we become Catholic, especially for someone who is uh, an adult and they are either no religion or they're, say, Methodist or Baptist or something, they become Catholic. We think of that as being converted. But reconciliation also is a sacrament of conversion because it's the first step of us to return to God after we've alienated ourselves by sinning. So this conversion is kind of a conversion of heart and it, it helps us to avoid evil 
um, and, desire, and, and helps us to have a desire to cooperate with God's grace. Um, and that is in the Catechism from, of the Catholic Church. You can, if you are interested again, there's a book called The Catechism. It's about yay thick, and you can look up. There's a whole, whole chapter on reconciliation. Um, all kinds of really interesting things that you can learn from there. Um, conversion also is a work of God's grace. Grace, of course, we know is not something we can earn. It's totally unmerited. God gives it to us freely. All we have to do is accept it. Um, conversion also includes our life of prayer. And, of course, we have that variety of names that the priest on Busted Halo talked about. Penance, confession, uh, reconciliation. I've even heard it called the sacrament of pardon and forgiveness because kind of that's what happens. So, when... We talk about reconciliation, we're talking about three separate acts, okay? We have contrition, confession, and intention. So the contrition means that we're sorry for what we've done. So if you go into confession and you confess something and you're not sorry, then you, the absolution won't take effect in, in basic terms. So you say, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I'm, you tell the priest, I poked my brother in the eye, right? Just something that a kid might say. And you're not really sorry because you were really glad you did it and you're really glad your brother cried. Okay, but you tell the priest anyway. When the priest, you know, gives you absolution, it's not valid because you're not sorry. So that, that is really important. That being sorry for what you've done is a very important first step to reconciliation. The second is the confession, the actual confession to a priest. And um, that we, we tell what we've done. We accuse ourselves of those things where we've fallen short and those things that we've purposely done wrong. Um, and that in, when we do that, we are recognizing God's mercy. We know that by saying these things, God is going to be merciful. We're, we're admitting our fault, and God, is going, God loves us anyway. The final part of reconciliation is that we intend to make some kind of satisfaction, that we intend to do better in the future. Um, so the satisfaction might be if you stole $100, you take $100 and you give it to charity. Or maybe you even are able to give it back to the person you stole it from. Sometimes that can't happen. Though, you may have um, read recently someone did, you know, do something like that. They had ordered something some food for their children and paid for it with a bad check and, you know, these years later um, is on their feet and we paid that, that what they basically stole from that restaurant. So you can, uh, make, you can make that satisfaction much later if necessary. Um, when should you receive penance or the sacrament of penance or reconciliation? You are obliged to receive it if you are conscious of mortal sin. Mortal sin are those things that are in the Ten Commandments, you know. Well, we have children here, so we won't name them all, but, you know, murder, um, you know, the big ones. We're talking about the big ones. Uh, but also once a year. We can all, we all do things, you know, day to day. Uh, venial sins are recommended to be, uh, to be um, confessed because it will help to build us up spiritually and help us to make better choices in the future. So that is reconciliation. So, so far, are there any questions about sacraments themselves or reconciliation in specifically? So you guys are all good with what we're talking about, right? The, the rest of what we're going to talk about are what the archdiocese requires. Okay, so these are the things that the archdiocese requires. We'll talk about each one of them. Parental catechesis requires that you be within a faith community that there is remote preparation and immediate preparation. So we'll talk about each one of them. So first, whoops, went too far. All right. So first, you guys are the most important people in your child's life. And if you don't believe that, I, I, I don't know what to say, but it's so true. You know, even if you feel like they love grandma more, 
I'm telling you that you are the most important person in their life. And they may, they, they push the boundaries with you because they know you love them no matter what. They're not gonna push the same boundaries in school. They're not gonna push the same boundaries in class in, in, with grandma because they know that you love them unconditionally, all right? That makes you the most important person in their, your child's life. They also recognize that, and, and the church recognizes this too, that you are their greatest example, not just in how to live your life, but also in how to, to um, practice your faith, which those two things sort of go together, don't they? Living our lives and practicing our faith are really intertwined. So basically, what the church believes is that because of this, because you are primary in their lives, that you are their first teacher in all things, and especially faith. So because of that, it's, the church sees it as your responsibility to form them, to help them to learn their faith, and help them to be prepared for all the sacraments they're going to receive. So that may seem like a big responsibility, and it is. And that's why the faith community is here to help you. So what will the faith community do? Um, faith community is here to support you. Um, you know, you prepare your children for a lifetime of faith, but it's within the community that that faith and the sacraments are experienced. So while your home is indeed a small church, the small, the, the community of faith is, the bigger community is what we're talking about. So um, one thing that's really important to know is that sacraments belong to the church belong to the faith community. So no one has a right to a sacrament. There are things that, have, that go into being prepared for a sacrament, being ready for a sacrament, and there is discernment involved in that, that the church, the people you know, around, so their catechists, their teachers, the priests, they are responsible for making sure that whoever's receiving a sacrament is truly ready um, for that sacrament. They truly believe what the sacrament is about. They have faith that the sacrament is going to work. Um, so those kind of things. Um, they, you know, the understanding is, is the most important part of that. Um, so more about the faith community. Oh, oh, I almost forgot about this one. If you're not a parishioner here at St. Ursula, and that, if that applies to you, let, talk to me another time or send me an email. Um, if you're a parishioner somewhere else and you come to school here, you come to religious ed here because it's, it's you know, more convenient or you just like it here, um, you need to have the permission of your own pastor to prepare and celebrate sacraments here. None, I've never had anyone say no, so it's you know, never a problem. But if that re applies to you, just let me know and we'll, we'll get that started. Um, I know we've got lots of people, uh, especially in the school, who come from a parish that doesn't have a school, so that applies to you. And I know we have a few um, religious ed students who come on Monday night because it's, it's more convenient than coming on Saturday morning or, or you know, whatever time their, their uh, parish does it. So, the next. What, how will we help you? Um, we're going to provide catechesis for you which is kind of what this is. So part of our responsibility from the Archdiocese is that you are formed, that you know what these sacraments that your children are going to receive are about. So that's important. Um, we will be here to help your children you know, learn about the sacraments. We'll provide you materials and resources and help <coughs> answer any, any questions. But I, I really need to just say one more time that we can't take your place. We just can't. If you're not practicing your own your faith at home and bringing them to mass then whatever we do in school or in religious ed it doesn't matter it won't matter at all you have to be taking your children to mass you have to be be celebrating the sacraments and and um, celebrating your own faith with them at home so that's so important so remote preparation that was number three I think on that list way back when 
Um, so there are two things that are required or part of, of remote preparation. One is last year. So your child had to be in some sort of faith formation last year. And the other part of re remote pr preparation, that's just what they call it because it's not right then and there. It's just outside of the actual sacrament. Um, is the concurrent um, ha um, being in, they're concurrently in uh, school or religious ed or homeschool, so in, in their faith. So those are the two parts of remote preparation. And I'm sure that th that applies to everybody, so that's not something we need to worry about, <coughs> but again, it's a requirement, so you, you deserve to know. Uh, immediate preparation. So these are part of what the what we do for immediate preparation. Um, we have the catechesis. We ask, ask that the parents be involved. Uh, we ask that you attend mass regularly to help them be prepared for their sacraments, especially rec uh, especially for Eucharist. It's really hard to for a child to be ready to receive Eucharist if they never go to mass and never see it happen. Um, we have retreats for Reconciliation and Eucharist. Um, again, preparation for reconciliation before receiving Eucharist is mandated by the Archdiocese. However, what that means is that they must be prepared for reconciliation. If you find once they're prepared and that they're not ready for reconciliation, that is okay. They do not need to go to reconciliation, but they are still expect, they can still um, participate in communion. So does that sort of make sense? You know, if any, anybody ever studied um, um, de like child development, human development, human growth and development, there was a guy named Lawrence Kohlberg. I remember learning about him way back when, when, we, when I was in school, you know, taking my human growth and development course. I think that's when it was. And he talked about the six stages of um, moral development and almost nobody ever gets to stage like five and six. But little kids uh, start, we all start, with the pre-conventional, what he called, and, and that's basically how do I avoid being punished or what's in it for me. So if that's where your kid is, they're not ready for reconciliation, okay? That's, that's like, you know, they're still like, you know, I'm doing right because I don't want to get in trouble. Number two, level two, is where reconciliation becomes important. It's when they want to be a good girl and a good boy because they want to not only please you, they, they're not as concerned about getting in trouble, but they want to do what's right. If your kid seems to want to, they desire to do what's right, and they're sad when they're, they do wrong, even if they don't get in trouble for doing wrong because maybe it's an accident, then that's when they're ready for reconciliation. It's hard to sort of figure out where that difference is. And I will tell you that my own daughter, um, she was way ready for First Communion. I knew she wasn't ready for reconciliation at, at this, this age that you're talking about now. And I was con considering just keeping her and not having her go to, um, to do First Communion either. But and she also had repeated first grade, so it wouldn't have been that big a deal, you know, for her. Because the kids that she was in school with wouldn't have been going anyway. But, but at Christmas time, I was at Mass. My nephew, who was exactly the same age as her, a couple months older, they're under my coat arguing Christmas Mass. And, and I pull my coat off. Why are you guys doing? Be quiet. And Jacqueline, my daughter, says, Tell him, Mommy, that really is Jesus. And I was like, <laughs> well, I guess I was wrong. You get it. You know, she got it better sometimes than I do. So I, you know, we went forward with it. But she was still not out of the preconventional, you know, understanding of right and wrong and, you know, good and bad. She was still, you know, just worried about getting punished or, you know, th stuff like that. So um, basically, you want, you're looking at maturity, you know. Um, the immature person thinks of themselves, 
they're self-centered. We move towards um, looking at and being more, more concerned with the other person's good, right? Um, that example of young children making bags for homeless people so that they can hand out a bag with a water bottle and, and a granola bar and some soap. Um, their, their motivation changes from fear, that fear of being punished, to love. They're doing right because they love you. Um, and it really, it grows with pay, practice, right? So anyway, most kids at the age of seven are ready for reconciliation, but not all. So we leave that up to you to decide. Um, but we ask that you go through the reconciliation preparation before deciding, okay? So how are you gonna prepare them? There are a couple of things. You're, they're being prepared in religious ed and in school just by their, their um, curriculum, their religion curriculum. You also received today, I know some of them look different, they changed the folders this year, um, and I still had a few from last year. So these, these are just like those uh, weekly readers or the Flom Gospel Weeklies that we use in school and religious ed. You actually take, take the first one and you can work on that with your kid. You take the second one. So it's not like one book to work on all at one time. The really nice thing I think about these is that if you're sitting, they're very short lessons. If you're sitting waiting for one kid to get out of football or basketball or you know whatever ball they might be playing or, or tap dance or whatever, then you can just sit in the car with your other kid and go over this. Um, there are stickers that go with it. That's kind of fun. <clears throat> There's also, I put in here a basic, you know, this is what each lesson is um, about. So it seems like lesson six is missing, but so if anybody has real trouble understanding what you're supposed to do, let me know and I'll try to figure it out. Someone else put this together for me, so I'm just borrowing it. <clears throat> I also put in here, and you don't need it now, but just so in case you want to, this tells you how to go to confession, and when we have our, both when we have our um, retreat and when we have our actual day of first reconciliation, these will be available. So, but if you wanted to, you know, sort of go through that, just to refresh your own memory if you haven't been for a while, you know, um, that's in there for you as well. So, we're going to go over the calendar. Um, you should, there was a new purple calendar, so please make sure you got that one. The one that came home in the packet a couple weeks ago, I've had a mistake on it, so I want to make sure everybody got the new one. So throw away that old one. The purple one is the right one. Um, so here we are at the parent meeting. That's today, the first, first part. Um, there will be three opportunities for you to go to a retreat with your child. Choose one. One will be here, one will be at Immaculate Heart of Mary, and one will be at St. Isaac Job's. And that's where I made the mistake. I mi mixed up the date for St. Ursula and Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, so just make sure that you're either look on the website or make sure you have the purple one and tell your friends that too. So the retreat is for the parent and the child. We have an option if you can't make any one of those three that we have an option for you to do it at home. Um, but also, you do not have to finish this book before you come, okay? You don't have to have it finished. The, then after that, in November, we have the, also the three opportunities for reconciliation. If certainly, lots of people are gonna want to come to St. Ursula since it's your parish, or most of you it's your parish. But if you feel, if you feel like you know, you're not able to attend our first reconciliation, feel free to go to one of the other two. But also, you can go any time. When your child is ready, you can take them any time. It, it, there is no, you know, no rule that they have to do it at one of these ceremonies. Most of them, it helps them to feel a little more confident because all the other kids are there. But, you know, you can certainly take them any other time. Um, if they happen to be sick, 
certainly take them another time. We have reconciliation here at 3.30 every Saturday. And I hear Father Steve, he's my boss, so I don't go to him, because <laughs> that would be weird. Um, and it puts, would put him in a bad situation, too, especially if I told him something really bad. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, um, it, Father Steve, I hear, is a really great person to go to reconciliation with. So anytime you see that he's on the, on the uh, schedule for reconciliation, I really encourage you to go. Really, you may not be here much longer because they only they only usually stay for six years. Um, so I know I hear people upset about that. I hopefully he'll be renewed renewed for another six years, but you know maybe or maybe not. Um, and that that's got to be coming soon. He is great. He's great with everyone, but he's really great with the kids too. He's wonderful. Yep. He's wonderful with these children, and yeah, and yeah they love him too. Um, so then after First Reconciliation, we'll have another meeting like this to talk about First Communion and what to do, and um, we'll have dates. The dates are all here that you can, you can read just as well as I can tell you. But uh, as you can see, our dates for First Communion are April 9th, April 17th, April 24th, and May 1st. There is this year a specific uh, mass just for First Communion. So, and each one of these masses will have a specific number of kids we can take. So eventually, after Christmas, I'll set up a sign up genius and I'll let you all sign yourself up for, your, for the date that you prefer. So, um, you know, it'll be pretty simple. Uh, we'll have rehearsal probably. We usually do the Friday before, but sometimes we have to do the Thursday before if there's something going on on Friday. It's like the first Friday or something they have Eucharistic adoration. Um, so are there any questions about the schedule, about what, you know, to do next? Yes? Um, it would be nice to know who's coming. Um, we'll probably set, set up a sign-up genius again to like just send around just so we know how much material to have. But since we all do the same retreat, we just prepare the material and pass it from place to place. But it would be nice to know if only 20 people are coming to the first one. We only have to have 20 sets of stuff together. We don't have to have all 150 together by that week. Um, so it is. it would be nice, yeah. So we'll, we'll send that. But if, but if you don't sign up, and you find that you can come after all, feel free. Okay? Yes? Is it the children and the parents together? Yes. Like yes. So, um, is it like a class? It is not exactly like a class. Um, it's a, more like a workshop. Um, you'll be doing a project together for reconciliation. So the, the whole thing is like a beginning to end sort of process going through what reconciliation is so we're talking about first sin and then how we fix that and it's really the kids seem to really get a lot out of it just be prepared for crime I'll any show them. maybe both <laughs> we haven't seen any adults cry yet but i guess it's always possible of course if anybody were to cry it would be me the instructional mass is that practice okay that's a good good question um, instructional mass, the uh, Father Steve will take the classes over. Uh, it might be Father Steve or it might be, you know, if we end up getting a deacon who gets, um, who, who becomes ordained or, you know, but we, he will take each class over to be, to just go through and explain what happens in each of the, each step of the mass. So that's, uh, Father Steve Venn had been doing it for the last couple of years, so, now I have to get Father Steve to do it. This is about mass or is this about the communion? No, it's mass it's itself. It's so mass. they go through. Okay. I mean, they do okay. go through the communion part, right. you know, the communion rite, but we, right. they start with the word, you know, I the liturgy of the Father word. Father Stephen took them last year. Right. Father Stephen took, took each class, took them from school. Um, if they went to school here and the religious ed students went during their religious ed class. We might even, um, we've been talking about scheduling one that's on a weekend, just so that anyone who wants to go can go. So who knows what, what we'll do. I'll be, we'll be talking about it later in more in depth. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes? And where are these 
They will be online. I will send you, so hopefully you signed in, and if you haven't been receiving my emails, um, make sure your email address is on there, and I'll send you the, the email with the link to the sign up. Okay? So they're actually going to make their first reconciliation. I'm going to say professional. Same, same mother. <laughs> basic same difference, yeah. Um, so they're going to make their, so they're not, they may, send, they may have to get a confession again before their first Eucharist. They so, might. Yeah, yeah okay. they so might. That's November into April. Right. Right. But I mean, seriously. You don't think it's necessary, like, no. Maybe you should turn it off, but seriously, what can they do wrong? I mean, seriously. Yeah. <laughs>